Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. The Focused Ultrasound Foundation is proud to host this webinar entitled Expanding the Horizon, Focused Ultrasound and Medication Refractory Epilepsy. In honor of National Epilepsy Awareness Month, this webinar aims to explore the scope of medication refractory epilepsy and the need to develop less invasive treatments for this debilitating condition. We will review the rationale and progress of ongoing clinical trials to test the safety and efficacy of focused ultrasound in epilepsy patients. Finally, we will discuss future directions and novel strategies being developed in preclinical research. Before we get started, a few technical items. If your connection is lost, please simply log in again using your registration link. Following today's discussion, all of the panelists will join for a live moderated question and answer session. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. If you would like to listen to parts of this webinar again, or share it with coworkers, friends, or family members, you will receive a link to the event recording early next week. During the next hour, we will hear from four experts about exciting new research and treatments for patients with medication refractory epilepsy. We are also incredibly appreciative that Corey, a patient who suffered with medication refractory epilepsy, will share his journey with you and our panelists. He is an incredibly brave young man, and I'm sure you will be engaged by his transparency. And now I will introduce the panelists. We will first hear from Dr. Vibor Krishna, our moderator for this webinar, who is an associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of North Carolina. He has assembled today's panel and carefully planned this interactive session. Other panelists joining us today are Dr. Michael Sperling, who is the Baldwin Keyes Professor of Neurology and Vice Chair for Research at Thomas Jefferson University and the Director of the Jefferson Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. He is also a member of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation's Scientific Advisory Board for Epilepsy. Dr. Travis Tierney is a neurosurgeon at Nebraska City Medical Center and has performed numerous focused ultrasound ablation procedures for patients that have focal lesions causing epilepsy and for movement disorders from essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. Dr. Max Wintermark is the chief of the Department of Neuroradiology at Stanford University and has performed significant preclinical research with focused ultrasound and epilepsy. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Krishna and Dr. Sperling. Thank you, Dr. LeBlanc. We want to thank the Focused Ultrasound Foundation for this tremendous opportunity to interact and talk about uh, the role of focused ultrasound for patients with epilepsy. I'm very uh, thankful to the fantastic uh, group of panelists. All of them are thought leaders in the field. And most importantly, they are passionate about the care of patients with epilepsy. So we'll start uh, our conversation with Dr. Sperling. Uh, Dr. Sperling, thank you for joining uh, us in this uh, webinar and panel discussion. We wanted to know what types of seizures or seizure syndromes are resistant to medical therapy? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start a little bit by introducing when, when we might consider the focus ultrasound. So the first issue to discuss really is what sorts of seizures, what kinds of epilepsy syndromes, what kind of people might be con considered in the future for, uh, for use of the focused ultrasound and, and, and in the, at the present, as, uh, for that matter, as uh, the technique is being developed. We are going to restrict this at present to people with medically resistant epilepsy. I think this is what we're talking about, P people whose therapy does not respond to conventional medical therapy. The official definition proposed by the International League Against Epilepsy a number of years ago, which is widely accepted, is that people who have failed to respond to two appropriate dose drugs at reasonable doses uh, should be considered medically refractory or drug resistant. Uh, so, you know, what kinds of syndromes are resistant? It, it really spans the gamut of epilepsy in, in, in that respect. The most common surgical syndrome that had been operated on was temporal lobe epilepsy, particularly mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, though that's starting to change. But really what we have are, are a spectrum of seizure types that where people have certain kinds of seizures which may emanate from any, any of the lobes of the brain that are resistant to medical therapy. And those are the ones that we think about using non-medical techniques, uh, presently mainly surgery or neuromodulation, occasionally 
uh, dietary therapy. So it spans the gamut from people who have widespread abnormalities in the brain, uh, kids who may have lennox gastro or Dravet syndrome or other uh, what are referred to as epileptic encephalopathies with broad abnormalities of the brain up to people who may have a very small, tiny lesion in one spot in the brain that's triggering seizures. At present for focused ultrasound, we're thinking that we would be thinking about people who have small lesions. Now, can I have the first slide, please? So this just, again, illustrates the point I wanted to make about drug regimen. This is from a very nice paper published a few years ago, uh, where you see about half of people respond to drug one, you buy about another 12 or 13% with drug two. So now you have a little over 60% of people responding. And then it goes up a little bit at drug three, not very much and, and minimally so after that. So yes, there's a tiny chance of response, but when we think about surgical techniques, for example, which may range anywhere from 40 to perhaps 80 or 85% of people stopping having seizures, uh, you know, that versus a, a two or three or 4% chance of response over the long term is going to be very low. And then the next slide, please. And uh, this is perhaps the most disappointing slide of all about medical therapy, though perhaps it's changing. And this again was from that same paper published in JAMA Neurology, looking at drugs and people treated at, 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 in different decades. So in the sort of in the 80s, the 90s, and then the uh, the aughts, the, the early 2000s, uh, that the percentage of people who responded to appropriately to therapy really didn't change any. So while we've had an explosion of, of drugs and, and medical therapy, uh, it really hasn't appeared to make a difference with the possible exception of Sonobamate, which was approved last year. And there is some data that makes it look like this drug is different because perhaps as many as a quarter of patients have extended periods of remission. How many years that will last is not yet known, but we have good evidence that one, two, or even three years worth of response occur. Can I, can I have the next slide, please? This would be a typical small lesion, the patient who's a candidate for surgery, who's failed medical therapy. <clears throat> These are two uh, coronal images on the left, a T1 image on the right, a flare image uh, showing uh, striking mesial temporal sclerosis. This is almost too good to put in a book or at a show because it's rarely this clear cut, but you can see on the right image where the arrow points, a bright atrophic hippocampus, loss of the digitations. So there's, there's disruption of the architecture. And on the left, you can see the temporal horn is enlarged and there's not a lot of gray matter uh, there compared with the opposite side. So this is, this is a typical sort of lesion and how do we treat it? So the next slide, shows sort of a, you know, a traditional operation for this lesion. And, and I should comment at this point that there are certainly other small lesions that could be targeted. So you, one might target, think about small lesions like hypothalamic hematomas, periventricular heterotopias, small cortical dysplasias as well. The, for the mesial temporal sclerosis, this is the traditional operation that still I think is done most often for temporal lobe epilepsy and anterior temporal lobectomy. This is the post-operative MRI, which shows a sizable resection of the anterior uh, four to five centimeters of temporal lobe on the, on the right side in this case, where the arrows are uh, with the, the, uh, uh, showing the uh, deficit, the, the brain defect. Uh, and then the next slide shows what we're doing in more recent years. We've been doing this for about a decade now. Uh, and this is mesial temporal thermal ablation. So one can say for that small lesion of hippocampus, rather than doing a large operation, as, I, as you saw in the previous MRI, can we do a smaller operation with benefit? And this is the immediate post-operative scan after a probe is placed. And you can see under the arrow on the left, that sausage shaped area is the ablative tissue, that black, or dark and gray line running through it is actually the probe uh, placement for the laser applicator to apply laser energy to, uh, to uh, ablate that area of the brain. And uh, you can see it's a relatively small lesion. Now that probe still has to be inserted in the brain. Could we consider then using focused ultrasound to create a small discrete lesion in a similar fashion? And then rather than what many people refer to as minimally invasive uh, rather than a whole craniotomy, a small three millimeter uh, twist drill hole to insert the probe. 
avoid inserting probe whatsoever and, and use focus, focus ultrasound. So this is an example of using an ablative technique. Could we use focus ultrasound as an ablative technique? Another possibility exists in applying focus ultrasound for neuromodulation, where rather than fully ablating tissue with it, might you shake it up a bit with ultrasound, alter, alter neural transmission. And there was a paper published very recently by a Japanese group in epilepsy. It just came out within the past month uh, where this was tried in, in three people with an alteration of intervertebral spike rate and alteration of seizures. There is reduction in both uh, with focused ultrasound as a neuromodulatory technique. So this is sort of what we're thinking about for the non-medical treatments. We right now have surgery. We've been able to go down to ablative techniques uh, with reasonable results, although uh, the efficacy has yet to be fully defined. And uh, might we then be able to use an, an utterly non-invasive technique like ultrasound for this purpose? Thank you, Dr. Sperling. So to summarize, would it be uh, right to say that that patients can present with uh, epilepsy that is associated with lesions, uh, abnormal tissue in the brain, a uh, classic picture that you showed for basal temporal sclerosis, and also patients who don't present uh, with these kind of uh, lesional epilepsy. And I, think, is it, yeah. I was gonna say, I would think for now, we're largely thinking about lesional epilepsy with small lesions because you need a nice target to go after. And if you don't have a clear lesion, it's a, it's a bit tougher. Now, arguably, if the scan is non-lesional and you did stereotactic EEG and showed mesial temporal onset of seizures, might you consider ablation for that? And you, you can consider thermal ablation for that. There are papers with conflicting results as far as efficacy, uh, at least one saying it works as well and another saying it doesn't work as well. Uh, and, and we'll weigh in on that further. So that might be another target population with very well-defined uh, focal epilepsy with SEEG or intracranial EEG of some sort. Got it. And then uh, as far as your point about medications go, uh, are we safe to assume that adding medication beyond say two or three medication, really there is a point of diminishing returns where seizure freedom is less likely uh, to happen by adding the fourth medicine, for example? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you can see, the diminishing return happens after the first drug. 50% of people respond to the first drug. You, you only have perhaps 12% of people or so responding to the second drug. And then the, at the third drug, it's, it's two or three or 4% at most. And with each subsequent drug, very little. So the, unfortunately, the, the returns diminish immediately. And certainly by the time you get to the second drug failing, the you're well into single digits and at the lower end of single digits in terms of probability of response. That sounds great. And then with the current armamentorium of, of non-medical treatments, you, you uh, pointed out for us treatments from resection, ablation, uh, neuromodulation uh, to address uh, patients who have medication refractory epilepsy and laid out for us uh, the background uh, against which uh, there could be a role for focused ultrasound in patients with lesional epilepsy. Correct. That's who I would think about. And again, I think resection and ablation are techniques that we have good experience yield permanent seizure freedom in a substantial number of people. Not everyone, but a substantial proportion of people will become seizure free. When we move to neuromodulation, that we tend to think of as more a palliative technique. Uh, so there, there are reports in the literature of patients who, can, who have been reported to experience periods of three months, six months, or even 12 months of seizure freedom, but long-term permanent seizure freedom, again, would be vanishingly rare with neuromodulations, which is why ablative techniques are better. And given the associated morbidity and mortality of epilepsy, this is important. So while many of us are concerned about creating lesions in the brain and the potential for causing neurological deficit, Leaving people with epilepsy means that they're at an increased risk of dying, an increased risk of injury, greater chance of becoming disabled. Uh, many people with longstanding epilepsy develop more in the way of memory deficits, uh, more in the way of psychiatric complications, particularly depression or anxiety uh, with each passing year. So taking a palliative approach is appealing in that you don't cause the trouble that you might cause in terms of some neurological deficit with a surgical technique. But typically the difficulty posed by surgery is relatively mild for the vast majority of people. And 
you know, if if you have someone who dies as a consequence of having uncontrolled epilepsy or has a serious injury as a consequence of uncontrolled epilepsy, that's a far worse outcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sperling. So you very nicely laid out uh, the need for uh, new treatments to address uh, some of the challenges that we face in taking care of patients with treatment-resistant epilepsy. And so in, in this context, we want to introduce, uh, introduce focused ultrasound. So can I have the uh, slide, please? So focused ultrasound technology utilizes uh, a specific ultrasound frequency uh, that can uh, be therapeutic uh, in neurological diseases. And so this technology, uh, as you can see, there is uh, a, a ultrasound transducer, which looks like a hemispherical ball, and it has 1,024 different elements, uh, what we call. These are little uh, sources of ultrasound that emit the ultrasound waves, and all of these waves uh, focus uh, in the middle of this hemispherical transducer. Uh, each beam by itself is harmless, but when 1,024 of these meet at one point together, then it can uh, really uh, uh, cause ablation in that area uh, or, or, or uh, do uh, treatment through a variety of other mechanisms. This technology is uh, integrated with MRI. As you can see, a MRI magnet uh, in the background and the ultrasound transducer mounted onto the uh, MR table. Uh, ultrasound uh, paired with MRI is a very powerful uh, technology integration where MRI provides uh, details of uh, brain anatomy, where we are doing the treatment, and also uh, allows us to measure temperature in the brain. Uh, and that helps us to uh, understand whether uh, the proper ablation has been achieved or not. Uh, next slide, please. So there are four uh, mechanisms by which ultrasounds can provide therapeutic benefit in patients with neurological disorders. And I've listed those uh, uh, all the way from left, uh, all the way towards the right of the screen. So we'll fo focus first on the right side of the screen, uh, which is thermal ablation. So when 1,024 different beams of ultrasound meet at a single focus in the brain, the energy is enough to raise the temperature and bring about thermal ablation. Uh, this uh, type of uh, treatment mechanism is FDA approved for treatment of variety of neurological disorders like essential tremor, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, tremor dominant Parkinson's disease, and a lot of uh, other uh, clinical indications are currently being tested as we will talk about those uh, indications in, in the context of epilepsy. A second mechanism by which ultrasounds uh, can be used for uh, as a treatment option for neurological disorders is for targeted drug delivery. As uh, a lot of you know, uh, during the uh, uh, delivery of therapeutics, we face challenges from the blood-brain barrier in the, in the nervous system where uh, the drug dosage uh, really only a fraction of it reaches to the brain targets. And the major impediment or hindrance uh, to that uh, uh, drug delivery is the blood-brain barrier. Using focused ultrasound coupled with micro bubbles, we can open the blood-brain barrier and allow for uh, therapeutic delivery uh, to the uh, target brain areas. Dr. Sperling also talked about ultrasound-based neuromodulation. So we know that ultrasound can alter the activity in brain. Uh, it, can, it can change the activity to our uh, benefit. And this uh, type of mechanism, ultrasound-based neuromodulation, is being tested uh, for uh, epilepsy patients as well. And finally, in the research phase, there is uh, a uh, a mechanism that's being developed uh, called histotripsy that would allow in future for us to do very precise tissue level ablation. And again, something that can uh, be foresee can be used uh, for epilepsy patients. And so overall, if I were to summarize uh, for focused ultrasound, it's a technology that allows us to treat neurological disorders and is investigational for epilepsy. Uh, the main advantages are that it's incisionless and that the results are immediate. 
it can be delivered in a targeted way in a, in a very precise conformal way. And so these are the advantages that uh, focused ultrasound has. Now, I would like to uh, take the discussion uh, to uh, Dr. Travis Tierney. So Dr. Tierney is a, a pioneer in the space of using ultrasounds uh, for patients with epilepsy. Dr. Tierney was uh, the first uh, uh, in, in the country to start testing focused ultrasound uh, for patients who have hypothalamic hematomas. Welcome, Dr. Tierney. Well, um, thank you, um, Dr. Krishna and um, Dr. Sperling. I just want to say what a pleasure it is to have you here speaking about um, focused ultrasound as a, uh, a very senior level epileptologist with excitement about it. Um, I approached um, uh, treating epilepsy after having been involved in movement disorders for a number of years, and uh, the neurologists really felt that uh, thalamotomy for uh, tremor was really uh, kind of a back to the future. You know, we were using this very interesting way of non-invasively controlling tremor uh, without having a DBS lead, but still not having cultural traction within movement disorders. And I think I can certainly say that that's the case um, in that subfield of neurology. However, the, the epilepsy field has really been embracing progressively um, uh, less invasive and less invasive technology very rapidly. So going from Falconer's um, anterior temporal lobectomy to more super selectives to laser interstitial thermal therapy. And I think some of the things that I'm gonna describe in a minute um, might, might seem to be a natural extension of that. Um, beyond that are things like uh, what Dr. Krishna discussed, um, neuromodulatory targets within the brain and the possibility for drug delivery for say, for example, blocking an epileptic foci to make sure that's where you would really like to take it out um, and then following up with high intensity focused ultrasound. There are a number of things I think we can do in the epilepsy space, but the real reason that we have it is because that space is limited currently with the 650 kilohertz device, we have an envelope of action that is basically in the thalamus and midbrain. And we wonder how much epilepsy is really um, attributable to those areas. Now, Dr. Krishna is gonna tell you about something very interesting based upon um, lesions in the thalamus that could possibly be even used for non-lesional epilepsy. But we really focused on a target that was central um, hypothalamic hematomas, just because we couldn't reach out to the hippocampal heads with the current technology we have now. However, with the introduction of blood-brain barrier opening technology, microbubbles, and I think uh, Dr. Krishna mentioned the idea of mechanical disruption uh, uh, with histotripsy, that it shouldn't be long, that we should be able to reach many, many cortical targets um, within the brain that are traditionally gone after with um, minimally invasive and open type surgeries. Um, can I see the, the first slide that um, I wanted to present there? This is a, this is a case that we did um, a number of years ago, about four years ago now at uh, Miami Children's um, Hospital because we saw um, a number of patients with um, an unusual disorder called gelastic seizures. Um, the, um, the reason we, we looked at these patients is because they had hematomas at the base of the brain. Not only do you get a particular seizure disorder, as Dr. Sperling mentioned, you get, you get um, behavioral and cognitive deficits associated with these kinds of laughing seizures, um, which are manifest as oppositional defiant disorder, despite a huge armamentarium of um, anti-epileptic and anti-psychotic medications. These patients, if they're having seizures every day, um, really are not leading lives that um, um, they would like to be leading, mostly because of the comorbidities of the medication, but also because of the ongoing seizures, particularly if they become encephalopic. encephalopic. This is one such patient, um, and this was our very first case, and we selected it because it was a teeny tiny remnant that we left behind after an open endoscopic resection. 
And it's so small, you might actually call this functional neurosurgery because you can hardly see the target, but it's there along the left ventricular wall. And I think Dr. LeBlanc has put a tiny, um, well, a large um, yellow spot that's actually much bigger than that area. But this girl was having daily seizures despite um, being on four anti-epileptic medications. And we thought it would be an ideal first choice because we thought it could be as small as a single shot, much like a thalamotomy in the um, hypothalamus. And we thought that the energy that could be delivered would be strong enough. And I think you can see in the insets there that we managed to put a lesion um, just above the um, uh, mammillary bodies there and um, along the wall at the gliotic plane where the remnant of the um, uh, hypothalamic hamartoma was. She was rendered seizure free. We did this under general anesthesia. And that's important. I think it's really hard to achieve the sound pressures that you need to achieve lesional temperatures of at least 56 degrees under awake anesthesia, as has been being tried in some other cases. And that may be re resulting in some failed cases because of um, patient um, discomfort. But all these cases that we did in Miami Children's were done with a patient asleep. Um, this would have required another. Um, uh, laser interstitial thermal therapy or endoscopic approach. Um, the ventricles are a lot smaller. We didn't dare go back and try to scrape the edge of the ventricle. We got a very nice clinical outcome of um, angle class one control and the eventual taper off of all of her anti-epileptic um, medications and um, her reserpidone. And she's living um, a fairly normal life off of, um, off of those medications. With that, um, um, what I think could really be termed a home run. We looked and went back and did a larger um, remnant of a hamartoma. We still have not done a virgin case, but I wonder if we have that case to look at there, be more on the next slide. This, this is a very similar case. Again, a, a young woman with gelastic seizures and dumb oppositional defiant disorder. In this case, we approached um, the, the hamartoma at the base of the brain. If you look in in um, panel C in the inset, you can see the hamartoma the way it was. In panel D in the inset, we went and did laser interstitial thermal therapy and got a nice disconnection out laterally towards the optic tract. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer to point these things out, but we left, I think, a little isthmus of tissue medially there. And this patient um, had a had a decrease in the number of gelastic seizures she was having per day, but she wasn't rendered seizure free. She also stayed on her um, anti-epileptic um, regimen and we discussed repeat laser interstitial thermal therapy, but given the success of the previous case, we thought we might be ready to tackle a little bit more um, confirmationally complex case. And what we did was just to take the patient back and perform a series of 22 overlapping um, hypothalamic thalamo thalamotomies, if you can say that, to completely disconnect that rather complex tumor um, um, from the base of the brain. So it was a planned disconnection surgery rather than hamartoma ablation. And again, this was done under general anesthesia. It did take some time, but you know we didn't have to make another incision or put in another um, laser um, filament. And she was also able to come off of her anti-epileptic medications and um, has remained seizure free, I think for three years now. So these cases are getting long in the tooth and they were the original um, uh, proof of concept that even fairly difficult cases like hypothalamic hamartomas are actually pretty easy to do um, with focused ultrasound. Now we did not attempt yet mesial temporal lobe cases because we just didn't see them. And I was worried that we didn't have the power. I think the recent Japanese paper um, expressing neuromodulation rather than um, ablation is suggestive that we still need a device that needs to be improved, perhaps a lower frequency device or the addition of um, micro bubbles to achieve the kinds of, um, of, of ablative experience that we have had with the hypothalamic hamartomas. But I'm very curious to see what Dr. Wintermark has to say about um, his experience um, more recently with um, the device in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Thank you, Bibor. Thank you, Dr. Tierney. This is, this is fantastic overview and, and 
goes on to show how you know even difficult cases that you approached uh, in a in a way to disconnect the seizure focus and, and uh, achieve improvement in patients' quality of life. So next we'll move on to uh, the discussion with uh, Corey, uh, Dr. Sperling and uh, Corey uh, will we'll, uh, initiate the discussion uh, about his experience participating in a trial uh, to test the safety and efficacy of focused ultrasound for epilepsy patients. Corey, uh, thank you very much for joining us as well. Uh, you're e equally part of this and we're going to ask Corey, Mr. Corey Ryan, who is someone who has who will tell us his experience as, as to what has happened. So maybe we can start out, Corey, by asking you what kind of seizures you had uh, were experiencing and what, 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 what kind of epilepsy you were diagnosed with. Um, I have simple partial, complex partial and grand mal seizures where my grand mal's are controlled by medication, but my simple partials and complex partials are not. And what, what, what are those seizures like? Um, I, I lose time and, and um, I freeze. And so I won't know that I had a seizure. And when I'm talking, I would pause and many times not remember what I was doing. Did you get a warning prior to when the seizure was starting or not really? Not really a warning. It would just spring on and happen. Now you said you had simple partial as well. So what were those like? Uh, the simple partials are just, um, it, they happen similarly where I would just, I, I wouldn't lose time or space. I would just freeze for a few seconds and then I'd continue on with the conversation if I was talking or continuing to do whatever action I was doing. I see, but if, would you still pause for a few seconds and not be able to speak? Yeah, I, I would still pause for a few seconds and not be able to speak. Okay, so you had basically seizures where you lo lost touch for a long period of time and then very brief ones where there were a few seconds where you weren't able to communicate. Yes. We won't, I, will, I won't go over the labels so much because some might wonder whether all of them were what we've called complex partial or now called focal impaired awareness where there's just a brief period of time with an inability to communicate. And how did these seizures impact your life? Um, well, I'm unable to drive. Um, I'm often sleepy unable to focus on things. Um, I have loss of time and there are safety concerns such as falling and balance issues. And I just, I just wasn't able to be very independent. Mm -hmm. Did your seizures cause you to fall? Um, sometimes um, if I were walking and I didn't stop before the seizure, I, I wasn't able to kind of get myself into a safe spot where I wouldn't fall. Um, sometimes I would fall, but it was very infrequent, the falling. Um, but when it did happen, I would give myself a couple of concussions. Oh, I see. That's not, that's not nice to hear. What yeah. about impact your, uh, impacting your ability to work? What effect did the seizures have on your working? Um, I was able to work for a while, but about five years ago, I just couldn't work anymore. What um, kind of work did you do? I was an actuarial technician, so a lot of math. Mm. I see. You're probably the smartest person in the room here if you were able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and how often were your seizures happening? Um, I was having about 120 seizures a month, so about four to five a day. So that's quite a lot. And then I understand you were referred for consideration of treatment for focused ultrasound. How did that come about? Um, it was, it came about from my uh, neurosurgeon at Mayo Clinic 
he recommended that I I go and do that this procedure um, before he would reinstall the uh, deep brain stimulator that had worked. I see. So you were treated with medications that didn't work, and then they did a deep brain stimulator also. Yeah, they did a deep brain stimulator, but I developed meningitis, and so they had to take the whole device out. And then what about conventional surgery? Had they, had they talked about that, or was that not considered possible for you? That wasn't considered possible for me. It Why? was too sensitive, too sensitive of an area for them to um, do the procedure safely. And what area are we talking about? Uh, the temporal lobe. So on the left side? On the left side, yes. And what was their concern if, about hap, if surgery? What kind of problem were they concerned that surgery might produce? Um, produce loss of speech, um, loss of um, movement. So there were a number of, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, um, but it was loss of speech was one of them. I see. So they put the, they put the deep brain stimulator in place and that helped you if I'm not mistaken, is that correct? Yes, that did help um, quite a bit. It had reduced the seizures down to about uh, 10 a month. So you went from more than a hundred a month to 10 a month with the deep brain stimulator but then yeah. you had meningitis and the deep brain stimulator had to be removed, correct? Yes. And then they thought that they would prefer not to put another deep brain stimulator in place. Yeah, at that time, they didn't feel like it was the safest option or a, a very good option. So they proposed focus ultrasound to uh, what create a lesion in your thalamus where the deep brain stimulator had been stimulating to replicate the effect of the deep brain stimulator. Am I correct in that? Yes, you are correct. Okay. So they sent you for the uh, focused ultrasound that was done in the thalamus. What was it like having the procedure? Um, it, it was different. It was new. Um, but it, it was a great experience in terms of their weren't any really uncomfortable parts of the procedure. It, it worked. Um, what was it like? So the actual procedure, what did you have to do for that? Um, I just have my head shaved and, and lay down in, uh, in the machine that Dr. Uh, uh, Krishna had shown in previous slides. I see. So they shaved your head. You were lying down in the machine. And how long were you in the machine? Probably, I don't remember how long, but it was probably about 30 minutes to an hour. Okay. Dr. Christian will be able to amplify on that a little bit, I'm sure. And uh, was there any, what was it? How long was it, Dr. Krishna? Uh, roughly around two, two and a half hours. Two, two and a half hours. And was there any discomfort associated, Corey, with the procedure? No, there really wasn't any discomfort um, at all. And when it was over, you what went back to a hotel? No, I, I had to go back into a hospital room um, just to spend the night for observation. Uh, for observation. And did you develop any headaches or other symptoms after that? No, I didn't um, develop it extra. I see. So, and what happened with the seizures? Um, my seizures, they were reduced to about five a month. So um, prior to the ultrasound, it was back to more than 100 per month, and then it went down to five? Yes. And where was the location of the th thalamic lesion? In the left temporal lobe. Maybe, Dr. Krishna, you could give us anatomic yes. information? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Spelling. I'll, I'll get to that information about the location. I, I wanted to ask Corey um, uh, a few questions. How, so you, you mentioned that you heard uh, from your treatment team about the, the trial, and so that's important 
that you got information from your uh, epilepsy team. Uh, if you were to go back in time, would you, would you do? Would you participate in the trial again? Absolutely, I would participate in the trial again, and I recommend that anyone out there who is thinking about it to go and give it a try because it works. When did you have your treatment, Corey? Um, just a little over a year ago. Okay. All right. So we had great discussion with Corey. Um, can I have uh, uh, the next slide, please? And so the, the question uh, comes about as to how can you approach uh, ablation, thermal ablation with focused ultrasound in patients with epilepsy. So one way we are looking at is uh, testing the, the safety and efficacy of focused ultrasound in a clinical trial. So it's a research study uh, in a part of the brain called anterior nucleus. And so, as you know, uh, there are uh, different regions in the brain that are interconnected to each other. And this part of the brain is at the interface uh, between where the seizure starts and, and then uh, spread to rest of the uh, brain. And so the idea becomes to disconnect the spread of uh, a seizure in the part of the brain called AN, which is listed here as AN. And so we uh, do ablation using focused ultrasound. Uh, and so it's a phase one uh, clinical trial and we have uh, treated two patients so far. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, this is, uh, you know, these are the pictures uh, of the anterior nucleus ablation showing with the arrowheads uh, in, in the left anterior nucleus uh, uh, ablation after focused ultrasound and potentially the, uh, the network uh, of, of uh, seizure focus that we can uh, of impact uh, using uh, this approach. So this is a great discussion. And next, we would uh, like to move uh, into the discussion with uh, our panelist, Dr. Max Wintermark. Um, so Dr. Wintermark uh, uh, has been doing uh, uh, cutting edge preclinical work in the space of epilepsy. Uh, using focused ultrasound. So thank you, Dr. Wintermark, for participating in this panel discussion. So the thank first you. question, uh, apologies for the interruption. First question we have for you is, what is the role of blood-brain barrier in the mechanisms of epilepsy? Mm -hmm. So per perhaps to come back on a few things you mentioned earlier, Vibor. So with focused ultrasound, you can do ablations, you know, like on the examples that you uh, demonstrated. Uh, but you can also open the blood brain barrier. Now, one thing that I really want to insist is you can open the blood brain barrier in a very focal location and in a controlled manner. And I think that's one of the elegant aspects of this technique. There have been reports in the past that if you use medication to globally open the blood brain barrier, uh, in the brain that you can potentially induce seizures. But again, that's something very different than what we're able to accomplish with uh, focused ultrasound, where we're able to open the blood brain barrier, again, not globally, but in very specific regions and also in a controlled manner. I think it's also something that is important to know that the blood brain barrier, it's not a binary thing. It's not that it's closed or it's open, you can open it to various degree. And again, uh, focused ultrasound really offers a way to finely tune how much open you want the blood brain barrier to, to, to be uh, in a specific location. Uh, you can, of course, with focused ultrasound, open the blood brain barrier a lot in one specific location, and that could uh, induce seizure. But you can also open the blood brain barrier in, in a much more controlled way. And perhaps we can go back to the slide and I, I want to show you another very elegant aspect of the focused ultrasound is the precision that you can accomplish. And you have shown all those slides, you know, demonstrating what you can accomplish in, in patients, you know, in tiny structure like the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. But if we move to the next slides in uh, rodents, a brain which are a lot smaller where all those structures so exist you know you can achieve and you can really deliver focused ultrasound in very tiny structures and that shows really the potential of that technique so i've been working a lot with a colleague at uva dr kevin lee and we have been really a great team and we have developed this approach for rodents but it could potentially be translated uh, we have decided to coin that technique as precise intracerebral non-invasive guided uh, surgery or ping. And basically what we do 
is we open the blood brain barrier again in a controlled manner in very specific regions of the brain. And uh, we at the same time administer a drug called quinolinic acid, which works in rodents, would probably not work in, in patients, but the concept could remain the same. And that drug basically does not cross an intact blood brain barrier, but when you open it in a certain way, it crosses the blood brain barrier and it can create very tiny lesions, such as the one that are demonstrated in this slide. So again, remember here, it's a rodent brain, so it's a super tiny brain. The different structures of the brain exist like uh, in uh, patients. For instance, you have the hippocampus here with its septal and its temporal portion. And you know, using that very precise approach, we're able to create very tiny lesion in very specific structures of the brain. And if we move to the next slide, we have been able to show that depending on where you create that lesion, uh, in a model, uh, an rodent model of epilepsy, you can either cause seizures potentially, for instance, if you target the septal region of the hippocampus, or on the other hand, you can reduce very significantly or completely uh, uh, make the, the seizures disappear if you target other specific structures like the temporal hippocampus in that, again, mesial temporal lobe mod rodent model of epilepsy. And I, and I think that the translational potential in my mind is, uh, is multifold. The, the first one is, you know, as you illustrated on your slides with the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, there are many structures in the brain that have a role in the, the genesis of the seizures. And I think that we could use focused ultrasound and that very precise technique to try to understand better which structures are involved in uh, contributing to the seizure versus which structures protect against the seizure. As you know better than me, there are ways to currently do that, but that's they are relatively invasive ways because you have to place intracranial electrode and then you can uh, interrogate the different regions where you have put the electrode to try to understand their role in the genesis of the seizure. Well, potentially you could imagine that you could do the same interrogation, but in a non-invasive manner, and you could potentially reach out to many different structures that are hard to reach out when you use uh, electrodes. So in my mind, that's really the, the, the clinical translation potential of that uh, approach that again, uh, I've been very fortunate to work on with Dr. Lee at uh, UVA. Thank you, Dr. Wintermark. And so uh, to summarize, uh, we have been talking about uh, focused ultrasound being in an incisionless way, uh, but in a precise and conformal way, being able to deliver therapeutics. But the exciting uh, uh, discovery or this exciting direction that you and your group are taking is to also interrogate different brain circuits to really differentiate the ones that may be underlying the seizures of a patient versus the ones that may be protective the patients from seizures. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is all uh, very exciting uh, uh, work. And then we would like to uh, highlight that, that uh, the, the other clinical trials that are recruiting patients uh, uh, currently uh, across uh, the, the world also are looking at ablation of the temporal lobe uh, itself, the, the onset of uh, seizure focus uh, in patients with epilepsy. And the trial uh, that Dr. Sperling, the exciting trial that Dr. Sperling mentioned, where ultrasound was used for neuromodulation in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy uh, came from Taiwan and recently published in Epilepsy. And so uh, a whole spectrum of uh, different therapeutics that are in various stages of uh, testing, preclinical stages, uh, clinical testing, uh, are, are, are uh, at the horizon uh, for patients with epilepsy. And so, so we are excited that uh, in future, there will be a lot more uh, uh, treatment options that are under development. So now at this stage, what, what we would do is we would uh, uh, like to have a panel discussion and uh, take live uh, questions. And so I'll uh, invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Susan LeBlanc, uh, to take over from here. Great, great. Thanks, Dr. Krishna, and thank you, everyone. That was a fascinating view of uh, focused ultrasound and what we've been doing in clinical trials and what we could do based on the results of the preclinical work. So thank you very much. And Corey, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your story, really. And I'm so glad that you're feeling better. Um, we have a lot of questions, um, so I'll try to, to ask 
as many of them as possible. I think a lot of questions are centering right now on the ablation. And um, perhaps Dr. Krishna and Dr. Tierney could address uh, and compare and contrast like laser interstitial therapy or surgery with focused ultrasound ablation. And what are the differences between them? Um, how much tissue is ablated during each of them? What are the advantages of the focused ultrasound um, again? And what are the side effects? Uh, are there similar side effects and changes of memory or mood or other things and compare and contrast them? So Dr. Tierney and Dr. Krishna, if you could address that. Susie, so you, you, you wanted us to compare traditional neuromodulation, say, to, to, to focus ultrasound in, in terms of efficacy and, and side effects? Or yes. just... I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Krishna. Yeah, so laser interstitial uh, thermal therapy and, and focused ultrasound, uh, Dr. Tierney. And you are you're suited because you, you're, you have experience in both. And so, so we'll, we'll love to hear from you. What are your thoughts comparing lit versus uh, the focused ultrasound? Well, I think the, the, the main advantage is you don't have to have a burr hole. It doesn't sound like so much to neurosurgeons, but to patients, that's a big idea. And there's always an associated risk of hemorrhage with, with passing instruments across the tract of brain that's not negligible. Um, so far in roughly 500 thalamotomies that I've done and uh, probably about 4,000 worldwide, we haven't had a hemorrhage in the thalamus or anywhere else in the brain that I'm aware of um, that at least has been reported. Um, so that safety profile is um, one of the reasons that I'm excited about treating movement disorders with it. And I think is probably one of the reasons that um, um, patients with epilepsy and epileptologists are excited because these kinds of surgeries often do result in fairly significant comorbidities, um, uh, not an insignificant amount of the time, even in expert hands. So the main advantage of in, in my feeling is the main advantage of focused ultrasound in particular over laser interstitial thermal therapy is that you can achieve a conformal instantaneous thermal ablation that even with a side fire laser, you're not going to be able to achieve. It, I think you can actually think about it as doing SRS in real time. You're actually taking out that tissue and then you can move, you know, in any one of 360 de degree directions in 0.5 millimeter increment steps, if you wish, or two millimeter increment steps, if you wish, to follow an epileptic focus that is not just a ball of tissue. So I think that's the real advantage of focus ultrasound that we showed. And I'm sorry, I didn't get to show the cartoon in the second case where we disconnected that hematoma from the base of the brain with, with 22 shots. So if you're patient and you have the time, you can have SRS type conformality um, with focus ultrasound that I don't think you can achieve uh, even with multiple RF um, uh, needles or with a single laser filament. Um, again, the major problem with focus ultrasound is its limitation toward the central part of the brain and the loss of energy as you get out towards the um, hippocampal heads. There are ways around that by using lower frequency and micro bubbles and possible, possibly histotripsy, even to reach the cortical surface. So I think that um, we will soon see that um, focus ultrasound probably will um, uh, eclipse the ease with which we can get to um, uh, distant structures and we'll be able to do it without drilling a burr hole in the head um, that you have to do with laser interstitial thermal therapy. Long-winded answer is I think it's safer, but that's where my nickel's gonna be down. I think focused ultrasound is safer. And if you don't get it the first time, you can take them back and do it again very easily. Thank you, Dr. Tierney. And so, so this, this was a good summary that, that uh, uh, focused ultrasound is, is an emerging sort of treatment for epilepsy. And so we don't have a lot of experience just yet, but, but the way things are looking uh, at this stage, uh, your point is very well taken that uh, safety, uh, because you don't have to pass instruments uh, through the brain and the ability to conform it and, and, and stack up like, like you so elegantly showed in your case, uh, these treatments to disconnect in hard to reach areas is, is probably one of the major strengths for focused ultrasound. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Wintermark, um, with your new exciting uh, preclinical research, 
Do you think the uh, delivery of medications to an area of the brain that's causing seizures would be possible in an area where there may be no focal lesion, but you know from other uh, tests that there is uh, an area in the brain that's causing it, but no lesion there? So do you think uh, the delivery of medication across the blood-brain barrier would be helpful in those particular cases? Yes, definitely. So that's definitely one of the nice aspects of focused ultrasound is you can open the blood brain barrier and you can deliver higher concentration of medication that traditionally have had a hard time crossing the blood brain barrier. And also because you can deliver them in a focal way, you can potentially avoid some of the side effects of those medication when you have to give larger amount of them to have some of it crossing the blood brain barrier, not just where you want, but everywhere in the brain. So I think that there's a lot of potential in that particular aspect of focused ultrasound too, that's beyond ablation. Great, great. So, so we've covered the blood-brain barrier opening and drug delivery and the ablation. Dr. Sperling, I've spoken to you a few times about this and I, I, I happen to know some of your inner thoughts about neuromodulation. So if you had to kind of prioritize which mechanism of action you like best for epilepsy or which one uh, you would like to see developed most, uh, what do you think? I really can't choose between the two. I like ablation, uh, you know, for, I think for the safety issue uh, and the lack of invading, invading the skull, obviously. You know, neuromodulation is inherently attractive because you're not destroying tissue. And you know, arguably, you know, perhaps what one might think about doing is attempting an alteration first with neuromodulation, proving that it works. You know, for example, Corey had a deep brain stimulator. They showed that the stimulation there in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, which basically is an activation that that, that worked. And then you can ablate, ablate the target later. So you could use it as a strategy on the pathway. On the other hand, for delivery of, I wouldn't say drugs so much maybe as genes, delivery of cells and things of that nature, which would be longer standing. It's, it's also intriguing to think about neuromodulation that way where you can transiently disrupt the brain barrier, you know, target, target gene therapy, for example, or optogenetic therapy uh, for that matter, and then perhaps induce permanent change that way. Very, very interesting. Um, great, thank you. Um, Dr. Krishna, I think for the people that are, that are listening to this webinar, maybe you can detail a little bit about what happens the day of the procedure, you know, when they come in, how long the procedure takes and uh, can they go home after the procedure um, and, and a little bit more about that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Blank. So the, the procedure with focused ultrasound is pretty standardized. And uh, now there are uh, uh, colleagues among us who have done uh, upwards of hundreds and uh, Dr. Tierney mentioned upwards of 500 uh, procedures. And so patient typically comes in the morning uh, and we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, a assessment before, uh, before the procedure. Uh, this, this procedure does not require anesthesia. So typically there is no anesthesiology involved. We shave patient's head uh, because hair can, uh, can be an impediment uh, for the uh, precise delivery of ultrasound and put patients in a head frame, which is uh, to keep the head immobilized during the treatment. And then patients go into the MRI scanner and we make sure that they are laying comfortably on the table. Uh, and the first uh, half an hour, 45 minutes is to acquire live pictures of the brain to un understand a patient's anatomy live at the time of treatment uh, and localize the area for treatment uh, that where the ultrasound energy has to be delivered. Uh, once that's determined, then we have a phase which is called sub-threshold testing. Uh, what that involves is we deliver ultrasound in low energy uh, to make sure that a future ablation is going to be safe and that patient gets uh, 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 adequate uh, uh, symptom relief. For case of epilepsy, uh, we, we want to make sure that patients are not having changes in memory or mood, uh, all, the, all those kind of uh, symptoms. Uh, once the safety is established, then we increase the ultrasound energy to deliver uh, permanent ablation and make these effects uh, uh, long-term. Uh, and the procedure is roughly two, two and a half hours, depending on the location where we are, uh, are doing the treatment. Uh, one uh, uh, difference uh, with that is Dr. Trini mentioned that uh, some of the treatments that he has done, uh, he has uh, used general anesthetic uh, for, for delivering these, uh, these ablations. And so 
Uh, for movement disorder, most of us have started to send patients home the same day. So we do a few hours of observation and then patients go home the same day. Uh, for epilepsy trials uh, still, because we are in the clinical research mode and uh, we still admit patients overnight and send them home the next day. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, we have a question um, that asks about whether this is already indicated for pediatric cases. So maybe Dr. Tierney can um, talk about his pediatric trial um, in those cases of hypothalamic hematoma for epilepsy. Um, perhaps um, Dr. Krishna and others can talk about whether pediatric cases are involved in that trial or not. But um, Dr. Tierney, can you talk about your, your pediatric trial? There, there is um, still one open safety trial for um, uh, pediatric brain tumors. It's BT005, and um, you can find it on clinicaltrials.gov. We might be able to, to um, show the number of um, uh, particular trials that have been touched on by this um, webinar, um, but um, that's currently being led by John Ragib at um, Miami Children's. Um, we do not have FDA approval. That, that study is simply the first study that can be done to establish safety. The next step would be to do a pivotal trial where we would have multiple centers and many more patients with um, um, pediatric brain tumors that would need to be treated. And that's in the midst of being organized now. So sadly, no, we don't have FDA approval yet, but happily, if um, you or your loved one has um, a hypothalamic hamartoma, even if it's not been operated on before, um, the University of Miami and John Ragib and I would, would be very pleased um, to have a look at those um, uh, scans and see if we have something to offer um, right now. And Dr. Krishna, your, your study is... Yeah, so we, we are in the process of uh, uh, initiating the study at UNC. We, we are in the process of uh, taking care of paperwork. But yes, I have uh, uh, given my uh, email address to anyone who's interested. We would uh, love to talk to you and understand uh, what kind of epilepsy you have and whether uh, this meets the uh, trial criteria and, and whether you can, be, uh, uh, able, can participate in this uh, clinical trial. Okay. Well, um, thank you everyone for staying a few minutes late and this concludes today's webinar. I wanna thank Dr. Krishna and all of the panelists for taking the time to plan and participate in this webinar. And thank you for your passion in pursuing focused ultrasound for the treatment of, of patients with epilepsy. A special thanks to Corey for sharing his journey and I'm so glad you're feeling better. Um, behind the scenes, I'm indebted to a dedicated team at the Fuss Foundation who seem to make these webinars happen seamlessly. Uh, Tony and John for their IT support, Paige for her unbelievable organizational skills, and Rachel for her expertise in communications. If your question was not answered or if you would like more information, please visit our website at fussfoundation.org or email us at info at fussfoundation.org. And again, thank you for joining us today, and please stay tuned to our newsletter and website for invitations to future webinars and online events. Uh, so thank you very much and have a great weekend.